Hi, today we're going to review a couple of uh, functions and look at um, some things that we need to know about them. So we're going to start with a piecewise function. So we learned in Algebra 2 that a piecewise function is a function, so it has to pass the vertical line test, but it's not just like a single equation like quadratic. It's made up of pieces of other parent functions that we've studied and of pieces of other graphs that we've studied. So in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces exist in this graph. Um, so pay attention to the kind of graph because right here this looks like it can be absolute value or this looks like it might be linear, but it also could just be a piece of an absolute value. So you definitely want to look at the definition. So when we write a definition, so we know that this is made up of other graphs, then we have to look all the pieces here. Okay, so we have to name the graph, so name the letters A to whatever. We need to give the variables that will be used all the way through um, a definition here. So that's what the X is, the variable. These are the different parts of graphs that are in this picture right here. And these are the restricted areas or the pieces that you're showing. So of this linear graph that has a negative slope and a y-intercept of negative 2, I am really only showing the x values that fall between negative 9.5 and negative 6. We put the dark circle on this side because that's where the negative 9.5 is included. And we put the open circle on this one because it is not included. So then you can see here's my absolute value and how it's defined. Here's my constant and how it's defined. And paying close attention to knowing this endpoint and this endpoint are the same. But right here it's less than, which means it's not included. And right here it's equal to, which means it is included. Because as even though there are lots of parts and pieces to this function, it still has to pass the vertical line test. So the parts of the definition are the name with the variable, the functions that you intend to graph, and the part of the function you intend to show. So now let's do some evaluating on some graphs. So the first one I'm going to evaluate is in the graph called f, at the x value of negative 5, what's the y doing? So when I go back up here, I'm going to negative 6, which is right here, and I'm going up here, and I wouldn't incl include that function value because that's an open circle, but I would include the function value that's on that vertical line, which happens to be here at 5. So I say f of negative 6 equals 5. And then we do the same thing at f of 6. So over here at f of 6, the graph is on the x-axis, so it needs to equal to 0. In this situation, notice we don't know what the x is. We're trying to find the x when y is 7. So I go up here and I look horizontally at 7, and I see the graph is right here at x equals negative 9. So if you're doing a problem like this, you have to designate the x value here. Because it's giving you the x and this is the function value, you can just say the value is y. All right, so then if I go over here to f of 8, I can see that f of 8 is way up here, and the function value is point, or it's just 5. And then I can see if I try to evaluate anything over here at 9, there's nothing vertically anywhere, so it's not defined at that point in the game. If I want to find a negative 2, so I would go, I'm sorry, negative 3, so I would go to negative 3, and I would go to this dot because that's the one that's filled in, so I can say it's 2. And then again, another y. So I want to know when I'm looking at negative 1, which is this piece right down here at negative 1, I can see that there's a value here at the dot, but there's also a value at 5 over here on the line. So you would have two x values that you could leave there. The last thing we're going to look at before we move on to another type of function is the domain. So when I'm looking for the domain, I'm looking for all of the x's. And if I look at this graph, the x's are all covered because there's a dot here, even though there's an open one. So when I start here at negative 9.5, and, and I go all the way over there to 8. The range would be bottom to top, so the lowest value I have is 4. But I wouldn't include 4 because there's an open circle. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I would go all the way up to this high value of 7 right there. If I'm talking about positive, remember, that's when the function is greater than 0 or physically above the x-axis. So I go up to my graph and I'm looking for all the time that it's up here. I can't include the x-axis because that's when the function value would be 0. And positive is neither positive nor negative. Or 0 is negative positive. Negative or positive. Goodness. All right. So let's see. It's above. It's above. It's above. It's above. And we hit 1 and it's equal to. 
So that means from negative 5, 9.5 to 1, I'm above the x-axis, but I can't include 1 because 1 is on the x-axis. I'm above for this little segment over here, and then I'm above from here to here. And so that's going to look something like that. The last one I want to point out is increasing and don't confuse positive with increasing or negative with decreasing. Positive is physically above the x-axis. Increasing is when I'm reading the graph from left to right, the y values are getting bigger. Okay, So when I look at this, I can see they're getting smaller, smaller, but they're getting bigger right here. So I can go from negative 4 to negative 3. They're not changing or getting bigger here, but they are going from getting bigger, the y values, from here to here. So that's between 1 and 3. And then from 3 to 4, and again from 6 to 8. So um, I've got some definition there using those union symbols to skip over. Okay, now we're going to look at one of our two new functions, and that is the absolute value of x over x, or x over the absolute value of x. So if you were in class, we graphed both of them to confirm that it was the same thing and this is what you get. It is a fraction with a denominator approaching zero, which means our graph breaks right here, and so there can't be anything vertically on this axis. So I have points that go over here and points that go over here. So let's say my x is 1. So when I take the absolute value of 1 and divide it by 1, I get 1. When I take the absolute value of 2 and divide it by 2, I get 1. When I take the absolute value of 3 and divide it by 3, I get 1. So you can see all of the points right here are on that horizontal line. Now if we go to the other side and look at negative 1, the absolute value of negative 1 is positive 1, but then we're going to go ahead and divide it by the negative 1 on the bottom. And that's why the y value ends up being down here at negative 1. So if I'm doing negative 2, the absolute value of negative 2 is 2, but I'm dividing by negative 2, so now it's still negative 1. And if it's absolute value of negative 3, well that's 3, but then I'm dividing by negative 3, so that makes that negative 1. So you can see that horizontal line that comes over there. Um, this is a special function, but do keep in mind that for this to be the function we're talking about, it has to be the same on the top and the bottom. I couldn't say x plus 2 on top in absolute value bars and then just put x on the bottom. Those would be completely different functions. The other thing to remember is it could be like this where the absolute value is on top. It could be um, like this where the absolute value is on bottom. So um, keep that in mind that they do have to be the same. All right, so about the graph, this is me just plugging in the numbers we talked about so you could see the value of the table, and this is just going over a little bit about the graph. So your domain would be everything except zero, so you go from negative infinity to zero, skip over, and then go out from zero to infinity because nothing interesting is happening on the y-axis. Um, the range is either y values of negative one or y values of positive one, so that's really the easiest way to write it. You could write it in interval notation, but that's way more work, so I would expect to see mostly like this. There is nothing on the x-axis, so there are not any x-intercepts. There is nothing on the y-axis, so there are no y-intercepts. And then if we start looking at transformations here, you can see this one, I put the minus 1 inside the absolute value, um, so the graph shifts over um, to positive 1. And so this line right here is positive 1. You can see the open circles on the top and the bottom. You can see the horizontal lines. This one, the negative in front, means it's reflected over the x-axis, so it's turned upside down, um, which means now the horizontal is on the bottom here and it's on the top on this side. And finally, transformations work the same way. If you have a 2 in front, that's just a vertical stretch by 2. So I would go up 2 before I put a dot, down 2 before I put a dot, and so that's really going to push those um, branches farther apart. The last one we're looking at is the greatest integer function, or the step function. And it's written with little square double bar brackets and an x in the middle. And this is what it looks like. It's a series of horizontal lines. Um, so when I'm doing that, think about going to a paid parking garage. I'm, hopefully you've been there with your folks. So when you go in and they say you can park here for two hours and they charge you a price. Well, what happens then if you go past your two hours? Maybe it's just 10 minutes over. You're still going to have to pay for the next hour. Well, what if it's 20 minutes over? You're still going to have to pay for that next hour. What if it's 
59 minutes over, you're still going to pay for that hour. But once you hit the hour over where you parked, then you're going to be charged for another hour. And so any minutes that are used between that um, would go toward that new value. And so that's what this is. This is the same rate, and then we're jumping up. And it's the same rate, and then we're jumping up. And notice what's not included here is included in the next step up there. So that's what a greatest integer function looks like. Um, again, it can be called a step function. Sometimes you'll see it referred to a floor function because um, we round down um, as we go through there. So let's kind of, um, if you want to put it on your calculator, then you're going to go to the math button and you're going to arrow over to the number choice and then you're going to arrow down to the INT parentheses choice. That's the greatest integer on the calculator. Um, so let's evaluate and look at the graph. So if we evaluate f at 0, then at 0, the function value is also 0. At f at 1 half, so I'm right here, the function value still is 0. So you can see anything here has a function value of 0. If I go to 2 and a half, so 2 and a half, the function value is all the way up here at 2. If I go the other way and I go to negative 1, the function value is down here at negative 1. If I go to 1 and a half, the function value here is down at negative 2. If I go negative 2 and a half, then I would see the function value is down at negative 3. So you can see it's not just rounding, you have to think about where the graph would be. So the domain for a greatest integer function is all real numbers, everything in the domain works. The range is every single step up, so that means all integers. The x-intercept is a range of information because it's the whole bar right here is on the x-axis. So every value between here and here, not including this end, would be part of the x-intercepts. So this is different because we have lots of them. We can't just list them out. And then finally, the y-intercept only has a single point right there. So you could say the y-intercept is at 0, 0. Transformations, um, they're pretty similar to just anything we've been doing. Um, if I put the minus in front, that's a reflection over the x-axis. If I put the minus inside, that's a reflection over y. If I put a 2 in front, that's a vertical stretch by 2, which means these bars get further apart. So like I would go over 1, instead of going up 1, I'd go over 2. So the next branch would be up here, and you can see that there's going to be a wider space here, and there's going to be a wider space when you go down. The um, 1 half would be a vertical compression, so that means I would go over one, but instead of going all the way up, I just go halfway. So it's pushing them and pulling them down and making them smaller. Um, if I have a two inside, that's a horizontal compression by scale factor of one half. And then if I have a one half inside, that would be a horizontal stretch or compression by two. And so what that means is if I'm stretching this when I go horizontally, like I would go 1, 2, and that's where I would put my open circle. So you can see this line is going to be longer. If it's compressing, then I just go over to a half. Then this open circle is going to move back here to just this halfway point, And it's going to make all the step lines look considerably shorter. Okay, so those are the three functions that we're studying. Um, the last two were new. The first one was just a good old-fashioned review of piecewise. And um, then we're going to move on and start looking at some other review topics. Um, next time I see you. Thanks, guys.